Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Let's just go ahead and read maybe the first uh, five or six verses here. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop must then be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetousness, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them that are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Let's just stop here. We'll, we'll kind of jump on here. These first seven verses do deal with the office of a bishop. This word translated bishop is also translated pastor, bishop, elder. And they are interchangeable terms. Okay? So you could call me Bishop Taylor. All right? You could call me Elder Taylor. Um, you could call me Pastor Taylor. Tomorrow at school, they'll be calling me Big Dog. <laughs> Hallelujah, I'm subbing at Westland tomorrow. The kids call me Big Dog. And the, and the other coaches refer to me as Coach Big Dog. So Coach Big Dog's here today. And all the kids start barking. Hallelujah. So um, he, he tells us, he starts out, if you desire the office of a pastor, the office of a bishop, the office of an elder, that would be, again, used interchangeably with Paul. So therefore, he's talking about the same office. Okay? Um, you desire a good thing. Amen. Uh, in Acts 20, 17 and 20, it used three Greek terms that show that these words to be interchangeable or synonymous. Verses 2 through 6 list the 15 qualifications of the bishop, the pastor. Uh, Ten are positive, five are negative. A 16th and is listed in verse 7 addresses the overseer's reputation as it relates to the world. Now let's look at verse 2. That sets forth seven positive characteristics. First of all, blameless. Literally means not to be laid hold of. In other words, it's just not, there's nothing they can find on you. Okay? You, you don't have a woman on the side. You're not, I was just talking, uh, well, I subbed on Monday at Wesleyan, and one of the uh, uh, people that, one of the coaches there that, I, that we've known real well for a long time told me he has a hard time trusting pastors or ministers because where he grew up in the hood, he said, he said, look, I wanted to sell drugs like everybody else said. My grandmama would have killed me. That's the only reason I didn't do it. He said, because I wanted that wad of money and I wanted all that. He said, but the ministers came right down there and bought the crack from the people I knew were selling it. Right there in that neighborhood. So he has a hard time trusting. Well, see, that's, that's not blameless, is it? They're, they're, they're able to lay hold of something on him right there that discredits his ability to be effective in ministry. You can't be uh, shagging the women and then trying to preach holiness on Sunday. Come on now. You can't, now I'm, I'm going to be real honest with you. You can't be down at the bar soaking up some suds and then that person who was sitting there next to you that you're trying, you know, and you go try to tell them about Jesus. They might go, yeah, yeah, you cool, you cool. They ain't going to listen to a thing you've got to say. All right. Blameless. Hallelujah. Um, other translations are, uh, go on and say above reproach or without faith. You know, in other words, um, the same Greek term is translated unrebukable. You can't, you, you, there's nothing to rebuke you for, okay? Uh, next it says the husband of one wife. This is a reflection of the social and cultural situation in the first century. A polygamy, easy divorce, remarriage were prevalent. In other words, Paul, Paul uh, and it's happening in the church now. I mean, you know, just the stuff that's going on. Now you've now you got ministers that marry the homosexual lover. I mean, you know, which is, that forget, forget, forget. Okay, forget whether or not, um, you know, they've been married more than once. They're, they're, they're going quite against what the Word of God teaches. Okay, but polygamy. So Paul, Paul's addressing social, cultural issues that says, you don't need, you, listen, you're the husband of one wife. Don't you be divorcing and marrying somebody else because it shall enhance your ministry. I've heard these things, you know. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I'm divorcing this one and going to marry that one because they'll enhance my ministry. No, they just dehanced your ministry. You lost credibility uh, in that. 
You know, I know some things happen. I mean, you, you can't help it if your wife leaves you and runs off and goes and does something else if you're, you know, if you're a pastoring. But just trading her in for the newer model, hello, just because she got older and a little worn out, got some, uh, got some wear on the treads, hello? Well, you know what? I don't go buy new tires just because they get a little wear on the treads. Are you here? I wear it now. I'll wear them out, and then I'll go get them. All right? You don't, you don't just trade your wife in because, you know, it's, it's, you've gotten been married a little long or whatever. So in this cultural situation where Paul's writing, uh, polygamy, multiple wives, uh, divorce and remarriage, we're just, and, and again, we're not condemning you if you've been divorced or remarried, but what we are saying is, you know, Paul is addressing that we need to be monogamous. We need to be, have healthy marriages. We need to make our marriages strong. And all this mess of just doing whatever the world does is not what the church does. It's particularly church leadership. Do y'all mind, I, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, vary out tonight just a little bit. I, wanna, I think I'm going to sit down tonight. Is that going to mess you up, Brother Bill? Not going to mess up your camera, camera stuff? I'll look over at your camera some, Carrie, so that you can get to do. There you go, Carrie. All right. What did he say? <sighs> Until my back end gets tired of sitting on this hard stool. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. Um, so the husband of one wife, so we're dealing with uh, uh, that era that where polygamy, easy divorce, remarriage, they were prevalent. So it's just, you know, in other words, there was an issue or there was a crisis in marriage. And we're having the same thing today. And Paul's saying, you need to be um, um, monogamous. You need to be committed to your marriage. You need to uh, demonstrate by example how to have a godly, lasting marriage. Okay? So the husband of one wife. Hallelujah. Um, so actually Paul's teaching that monogamy is a requirement to be a pastor. So he must be a one-wife man. Marital entanglements beyond the one can bring discredit to his position and a reproach on the church. Now, you've been around long enough to know when the pastor runs off with another woman in the church and he's going to go back in the pulpit, there's a whole lot of discredit to him and a whole lot of people talking outside that community about, yeah, well, that, that church, I mean, he, he, he left his wife for that, sec, that, that organ player. They was running around for two years. You know, I ain't never going in there because a Jezebel, I mean, oh, you, you've brought discredit. Well, you don't know the whole story. Listen. We want to minister to people on an individual level and bring restoration to them. But at the same time, we need to preach an ideal and, and, and a, a standard where we say, ministers, you need to make sure you keep your marital house in order and live right and treat your wife right and do right by her. Amen. You're required to do that. Amen. A number of years ago, when we, we came to Greensboro and we were here, and I guess we had still, we only been here for just a three, four years. And they had this pastor up in Danville. And it was all in the papers. Because he was going to marry one of the 16-year-old congregants. But he wasn't divorcing his 40-year-old wife. Yeah, see what had happened, he gotten over, she got gotten kind of old and out of shape, and he had started going down to the gym and getting in shape, and he's going to trade in mama for the 16-year-old babe. Yeah. Well, he, you know, no credit to him, okay? Totally discredited him. And the, and the mom and dad, see, you get, get under the wrong kind of spirit, and it'll get off on your congregation, and they'll start believing that's okay. It ain't okay. If you're in that kind of church, run. Your pastor's got devils. Hello? Who? I keep hearing you say Chester. <laughs> Never heard that one before. All right. Um, sober here means temperate and specifically free from excess, having a well-balanced or self-controlled life of good behavior, uh, so sober means to be temperate, free from excess. We're not being excess about anything. 
even doctrine. Amen? We're to be balanced in doctrine. We're to be sober in life. Um, we're not getting crazy about anything. You know? Um, and pe some people go off on tangents. It's, uh, it's all right to drink. And they just spend all their time trying to prove it's all right to drink. And all they want to do is talk about that they can drink. And I want to drink. I, I tell you, when you start talking like that and that's all you think about, there's a problem. There's a problem. You're look, you're in your own heart, you're being condemned and you're just trying to prove it's okay because you want to get away with your flesh. Anyway, I'll shut up and move on. Okay? Of good behavior, remember he's supposed to be of good behavior, refers to conduct that is orderly, respectful, and honorable. We need to have honorable conduct. Amen. You don't need to be acting like the world all the time. Or you don't need to be acting like the world. Now we just talked about this Sunday, how that um, there was a pastor uh, of a quote word church that's kind of gone gracie and they had a birthday party for the wife and they, they played he, he the pastor was the dj he played about 30 or 40 secular songs and listen i understand not a, you can't just go to hell because you played a secular song i mean when jesse's wedding we played secular music for for the for the reception i mean play some bgs you know uh, nathan did some marvin Gaye. Um, that may embarrass your cat and made him leave the dance floor with his wife. Just walked right, walked right off and left her standing there. I almost threw him out of the game right then. Anyway. And, um, but it wasn't crude stuff. It wasn't lewd. There weren't, it weren't, weren't lyrics of cussing and, and, and raunchiness. They said, this one, one person wrote another minister that he knew, and, and he was embarrassed that he was there. One, one of the church leadership people got up on the table, a woman, reached up to the ceiling and grabbed, kind of touched the ceiling and started out like she was pole dancing. This is not honorable behavior for leadership, for pastors, for pastors' wives, for anybody. We need to have honorable behavior. What would the world think if they walked in? And then you go try to tell them about Jesus. You're going to try to lay hands on them and minister the healing power of God. And I will, you'll be like Samson. You wish not knew that the, anoint, the power or the, anoint, the Holy Ghost had departed from you. Amen. Now that went over big. Okay. And then um, apt to teach it just simply means able or competent to teach. Now the next one is not given to wine. And um, of course the same word for wine, oinos, oinos is the same word for, Greek, for wine or grape juice. Um, so he refers to both, but here he's, he's a, he is either, either advocating temperance or abstinence. Now the, the commentary here says, other scriptures give guidelines for believers, especially leaders, that take a strong stand against drunkenness. Now the awful consequences of traffic fatalities and ruined homes force a thinking believer to make his decision based on, on the basis of the great principle stated in Romans 14, 21, it is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth. Or is offended. Now let's just stop there. We got more people concerned about their right to do something than they are the consequences of offending a weaker brother. Hello. Because all they care about is they want to be free to engage. And you close the door. I'm telling you, if you're going to drink wine, you close the door to your ability to minister to people who've dealt with, uh, with substance abuse or alcoholism. You have, no, you have no place to be able to speak from. I don't, I don't give a rip what you say. Because that person knows that that thing you're drinking is des destroys or has destroyed their life. You have no ability to minister to the child of an alcoholic whose family was ruined because of alcohol in the home. You have, no way, you have no place to speak. Now, you might get mad with me, and you might run off and say, I'm under grace. I don't ever give, give a rip what you're under. We are here as ambassadors for God, the, the extended hands of Jesus Christ. We are here to minister to people, and all you want to be able to do is get your little Chardonnay or your little red wine or your little white wine or your little cognac or your whatever, your rum, your long neck beer, and go sit down and drink it out in public with your rest of your Christian buddies and talk about how free you are and you're damning 
someone sitting over there who's watching you and he listens to you talking about the Lord and they're and they're they're all messed up. It is more than about you. Thank you for your enthusiasm. But I'm free. Only use not your freedom as an occasion to the flesh. The Apostle Paul. Thank you very much. It is time that we start demonstrating a concern and a care more for the world than we do about what we can do. He whom the Son has set free is free indeed. But our liberty is not a liberty to serve the flesh. We've been liberated from the captivity of Satan to serve the living God. And I'm about, I'm just, I am fed up with Christians trying to justify that it's okay to drink beer and to drink wine and to drink rum and to smoke stogies because they're liberated. And all the while, the world is watching. Oh, they mean, you might have some people come and tell you, you're the coolest Christians I've ever met. Don't listen to the people who blow wind up your skirt. There are people that will, go, that will live and, and, and be destroyed because they saw you drinking. Because you had to be free. And your freedom became an entanglement in their life. Because the very thing you're doing under the guise of your liberty in Christ is a thing that has destroyed their life. Hello. I mean, when are we going to start having churches where they go over and watch soft porn at the leadership meeting? That went over big. Is anybody, is anybody in the building? Turn, turn the lights up. So got real quiet on that one, didn't it? I said, didn't it? Hallelujah. Well, you guys over here on the side can sit comfortably unless I get up off of here. <laughs> Which might happen. Okay. Well, now that everybody's so thrilled about that one, and I know you people that are watching, you know, the people who are monitoring us, wanting to see what we say or don't say, uh, go ahead. I don't care. I'm more concerned about the souls of lost men and women and people who are bound by things than I am about your freedom to do whatever you want to do. Because you're really not free to do whatever you want to do. I'm a servant of Christ. I'm a bond servant of Christ. My actions are yielded and submitted to his authority and will and rule. And if my actions bring disgrace or bring um, reproach on the kingdom of God, then my freedom is no longer freedom. And if it causes people to stumble, hello, amen. Moving right along, not greedy or filthy lucre is, actually he's not a lover of money. The New International Version says it this way. Money becomes dirtier when it's viewed with greed or obtained dishonestly. You can be, listen, you can be quoting all the prosperity scriptures and be greedy. The Lord's going to bless me. Lord's going to do this, Lord. And the only, thing, only reason you're giving is because you want to get rich. That's greedy. Our number one motive for giving is because we love the Lord and we want to help advance the kingdom in the nations and the world. Yes, God wants to bless you. I will not, I'm not going to back off of that. Yes, God wants to bring return to you. But you've got to keep your heart right and you've got to keep it right, right all the time. You do not want to pierce yourself through with many sorrows. If you err, if you err in particular in the arena of money, if you err, you pierce yourself with many sorrows. And so it's, got, it's important that you, um, you keep your heart right, not become a lover of money. And I know people who, who, who do all the prosperity things and really they're just lovers of money. 
they're giving because they're expecting to get a thousandfold return. Oh, they'll say it. Yeah, because you know, I want to bless the kingdom. Except when you start seeing them prosper, they stop blessing as much. I've seen it happen. Or then their, their money becomes a controlling agent. Okay. How many are enjoying this so far? I would like to know it. Okay. The only positive characteristic in this verse is the term patience, and its meaning is to be gentle or peaceable. Um, then it's followed right back up that, you know, patient but not a brawler, um, which is the contrast to being patient and, you know, and gentle and peaceable. Um, you know, um, not a brawler. The literal meaning is, uh, to, is abstinence from fighting and describes someone who is dis, uh, who, who's disinclined to fight. In other words, they want to walk away from the fight. I know some folks. I know some people. They are ready to fight at the drop of a hat. Matter of fact, they will get their own hat, take it off, and drop it so they can fight. You know? I mean, if you cross them, if they perceive that you have crossed them, they are ready to cut your head off. Hello? We, we can't be, in, we, we need to be disinclined to fight. We need to be looking for ways out of the circumstances. Soft answer turns away wrath. We need to be finding ways to not have a fight instead of looking for, looking for a fight. Hello? People, some folks are just looking for a fight all the time. Okay. And then now we're down to verses 3, 4, and 5. Um, verses 4 and 5, or actually chapters 3, verses 4 and 5. Uh, 4 and 5 deal with family relationships of the spiritual leader. He's one that rules his own house well. The Bible views the father as the head of the marriage and the family. Uh, the parenthetic question is, in verse 5, is a strong argument for qualification. With um, all gravity, you know, it says with all gravity, does not mean with strict uh, reserve or somber sternness. The sense is with complete dignity. In other words, you don't cuss your kids out. Now, I know parents. We, we've had uh, our kids come home from high school back when they were in, uh, the girls were in high school. Well, none of them are in high school now. But talking about friends, their friends would come over and talk about how their dad uses, drops the F-bomb on them. But then goes in, in, to the chapel and, and talks about how the Lord's using them to minister to the youth. And at home, they're F-bombing their kids. There's no dignity in that. And, and you, have, you have zero respect out of your children when you do that. And I'm going to tell you something, parents. They're going to, you're going to have time in your life. You're going to have to repent to your kids. You, you chastise them too harshly. You chastise them incorrectly. Amen. Don't you be some bonehead when you've made a mistake. You say, well, I ain't telling them I'm sorry. I'm the daddy. You'll gain more respect and more authority in your children's life when you've made a mistake and you tell them, I was wrong, I shouldn't have handled it that way. You were wrong in what you did, but I shouldn't have handled that the way I did. They'll respect you more. Don't you be cussing your kids out. That's just, that's just wrong. I said, that's just wrong. That's not, that's not with honor. That's not respectful. Okay? So have dignity. Being a leader demands experience and wisdom for making decisions. Mary says here, for a man knows how to lead his own house. I'm not sorry, I jumped down one word. word yeah. Verse 6 is not a novice being lifted up with pride. Uh, you can't, we, we'll take somebody to get saved, and three weeks later, we'll put them in the ministry as an elder, and, and three months later, they're in bed with somebody in the church. And let me tell you something. It's the leadership's fault. They weren't ready for that. They weren't prepared for that position. They weren't prepared to deal with, with women who seek uh, men of power. I've seen pretty women go after ugly men only because they had power. Honey, a dude, or sir, it ain't your looks. Hello? It's the fact you have a power position. They're attracted to the power. And so they come after the power. And y'all, you think you think a man is time to unbutton my shirt and get me a Mr. T necklace on. Show some chest hair. You just ain't all that. Not not we don't put novices in positions. 
They need a time of service under the guidance of elders and older to, to lead them and to, and to mentor them and, and to tell them and, when, and to help them see things coming that's going to be uh, detrimental to them and not just stick them in there. And that's why I said, not a novice. The devil will come after them and eat, their, eat them alive. But they can preach. Well, then let them preach under the guise and tutelage of overseers who can guard their life and not put them into a place yet. Give them opportunities to grow in a safe place. Hello? But he's, he's called, we're going to ordain him. Well, he says here, not a novice. Why? Lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. That novice thing will get, you, get your clock clean. Amen? The word lifted up in pride means literally means wrapped up in smoke. You'll get so caught up in the aura of what you're doing, you forget about who you are. So pastors, church elders, you got young men that you see the call on? Great. Mentor them. Protect them. Protect that anointing until they've matured and they're no longer a novice and they've been trained and they've been developed. Don't stick them in a place where they're going to fail. I mean, in most cases, if you do it wrong, they're just destined to fail. Oh, they're destined for great things. Not if you disobey the Bible. He says, don't put the novice in. Particularly here, we're talking about the office of a pastor. Why? Because pastors counsel people. Now, we have a rule here. Y'all know what our rule is? I don't counsel alone. Now, I may, me and you may be in the office, and nobody else in the office, but the door will be open, and there will be other people in the building. Why don't I counsel alone? Two reasons. One is anybody can say anything they want to say, and you have no defense. Two is, I don't trust anybody's flesh, including my own. Oh, aren't you more mature than that? No, I'm smart enough to know flesh is flesh. Right circumstances, right situations, flesh can get you in more trouble than you'll ever get out of. So what do you do? We are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit, and have no confidence in the flesh. Or we can say it this way, put no, give no um, uh, don't trust the flesh. I don't trust the flesh. Yours, mine, ours. Well, pastor, you're supposed to be a man of God. Yep. David was the king. Hello. How many men have fallen because they didn't keep set certain? And this is what you teach young ministers. You keep certain rules of of ethics and integrity in place to protect you because you're a carrier of a specific anointing for ministry. And it is imperative that you guard that at all cost. Even on the sense of being, some people might think people think you're being overboard or silly. I'd rather be overboard and silly than thrown, than thrown under the boat and run over. If I, if you're never alone in a circumstance, then the circumstance can't happen. It's a safety issue. So, um, how did I get off on that? Yeah. Then he goes on and says, uh, the, uh, the spiritual leader, the elder, overseer, elder, pastor, must have a um, good report of them that without. Uh, Timothy, he wrote it more over, he must have a good report of them that without, lest he fall in reproach and snare the devil. Uh, Non-Christians in Timothy's locale should, would have been able to look at the churches, and especially the leaders, and find nothing wrong or even suspect. A good report brings an effective witness. Hello. At this point, Paul leaves the, the role of the pastor and goes into the role of deacons. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, 
holding the mystery in, of the faith and a pure conscience. And let, let these also be first proved. And let them use... <coughs> Let them use the office um, of the deacon being found blameless. Even so, their wives must be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, man, that's a thing, ruling their children and their house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Jesus Christ. All right, let's go back, let's back up through here. Let's talk about the deacons. Now, the deacon board is not the bunch that runs the church. I know in congregational little churches, the deacon board are the five businessmen in the church who get in and tell the pastor what he is and what he's not going to do. Study it. The deacons fed the widows. In the book of Acts, they had to choose out seven men full of faith and the Holy Ghost to take care of ministry to the Grecian Jews' wives, or the widows, the Grecian, the Grecian widows. Because they weren't getting ministered. And they said, choose out seven men full of faith and the Holy Ghost to attend to this matter. We're going to give ourselves to the word of God in prayer. We now have, in congregational rule churches, the deacons all think they run the thing. Well, just because you know how to run a business don't mean you know how to run the church. Hello. Well, I'm a businessman. Well, we can get some wisdom on business things from you, but you don't need to be running the church and don't you need to be telling the pastor what he can and can't preach and telling him what he can and can't do in the anointing because you might run somebody off by, by praying for the sick or casting out devils. That's not your calling. Amen. Go fix uh, widow Esther's windows. Go get you a hammer and a nail. That went over big. All right. All right, so this section, verses 8 through 13, lists the qualifications for the office of a deacon. Now, several of these were given also for the pastors, um, and they're repeated. But the deacon, the servant, the minister, all come from the Greek word diakonos, 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 okay? It's the collective term for deacon is a special word for a class of helpers that was subordinate to the pastors and elders, okay? Acts 6 gives us the picture of the first deacons. Deacons first must be grave. Serious, worth of honor, respect. Deacons are not to be double-tongued. That means saying different things to different people or giving to reputation as a tail-bearer. Okay? Um, verse, again, they're not to be, let's see here. The word mystery, verse 9, holding the mystery of the faith is a pure, pure conscience. Now, the word mystery here does not mean it's a mystery to us. It's a mystery to the world. Okay? All right, we've reached the zenith of the uh, unpadded bench there. All right. Did I mess you up, Bill? We're good. All right. Mystery refers to the secret unknown to the masses, but revealed to the believer or believers. Um, it's connected with faith. It means the truths of the gospel revealed in Jesus Christ. We are, you know, we hold the mystery of the faith in their pure conscience. We are holders of the mysteries of the faith in Jesus Christ. And we're to do it in a pure or clean or clear conscience. Um, let him first be proved. That is put on probation. The Berkeley translation says put him on probation. Now, dear Lord, we do things in churches that you just, you shake your head at and think, what were they smoking before they came to church? Or they were dipping into the medicinal wine. Or what? A number of years ago, when I first got saved, and I grew up in a particular denomination in my city, we had three churches of that same denomination. Um, there was the first. There was another one that was not in the city when it was created. It was outside the city. And then there was a third one that was a split from the, uh, not the first, but the other one. I don't want to, you know. Well, our church split was nasty. I was a young kid, but we were, my family was, we were in it, and, you know, certain families got mad about this. Families get mad over stupid stuff. And they go out, and they want to split a church, and go start their own church, and have it their way. Let me tell you something. When it comes to the things of God, Frank Sinatra is not your theme song. <laughs> I did it my way. 
Or Elvis. <laughs> I'll do it in my way. Right. Anyway. But we get upset over this, or we don't like this, or this group's mad at this group because they don't like this preacher. I, 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 had a, I had a relative that got talking about the pastor, that, uh, the, the last pastor that I had in that denomination that performed my wife's and I wedding. And I had a relative that, well, I just don't like the way he doesn't preach. He just, I, I just, and I chewed her out. Who do you think you are? I said, that man is a good pastor. He's a good teacher. He loves, he's, he, now let me just tell you something. He was not a preacher. He would try and it just didn't work because that wasn't his gifting. He was a teacher. But see, they're out there wanting a preacher. I want you to preach. Well, bring in an evangelist and get over yourself. Instead of trying to put that man in a box to fulfill your personal desires because that's what you want. Well, who do you think you are? That's a good man. They're, 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 what? they're working towards stirring up the trouble to get him voted out. Next time they had the vote, voting going on. Yeah. They're all working behind the scenes. Going to get him voted out. And, and he finally, when he didn't get enough, enough, he, he just stepped down. When he didn't get enough, of the, no, he, he still got voted back in. But it wasn't a high enough percentage. He felt like it was, it was counterproductive for him to stay. What kind of people? What are we doing? We're playing games. I said, we're playing games in the church. We don't need this mess in the church. Hello? Glory to God. So I, I, I said, let them first be proved. So <clears throat> I had first gotten, I mean, I had just gotten saved back in 1979, July the 11th, 1979. Four days later, I got baptized in the Holy Ghost. One week later, Janie got born again and baptized in the Holy Ghost. Uh, same church, same place, same altar. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But I've been, you know, and, I'm, and I'm on fire for the Lord. I'm just, you know, I'm zealous. I am stupid. I am wide open for Jesus and don't know what to do with it. Think I do, but don't know. I have a little Fiat 124 action. About then I had the Fiat 2000 Spider, which same, same body style, just the new number on it. I think it had a little bit bigger engine in it. Um, I, forgot, I forgot how much bigger the engine was. They caught the 2000, the Spider 2000. Looked just like the 124, just bigger engine and, you know, and stuff. And, um, and didn't have real wood on the panel. had plastic. Anyway, the, the 124 had real wood on the dash and stuff. Um, and I would put up there a, a Strong's Concordance, a, a, um, an Amplified Bible, and then I had a Bible big enough to choke a mule. I had all three of them across. It took up my whole dash. I thought I knew everything. I've been saved three weeks. But apparently I knew more than some of them folks. Because in the fall, it was time to elect the deacons. And you do it by voice vote in, um, Brother Billy, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You do it by, by voice recommendation and then, and then nomination and then voting. Well, they had a man in the church. Now, he had come from the other church, the first church. No, he, I mean, the, no he, he'd come to the first church from the other church that was a split from the second church. Y'all, have I lost y'all yet? Okay. There was, there was the SP church on the outside of town, which was actually there, there and then, then the first church was in town, and then the SP church split and had the faith church. It was called faith denominational church. So the SP denominational church has split into the faith denominational church, and the faith denominational church had gotten a pastor. They, they had voted so many pastors out, they sent this one down and said, well, you ain't getting another one. You bunch of cantankerous individuals. Now, we had a Halloween party uh, over top of the pulpit area while the building was being built. They hadn't, got the, hadn't finished it. We had a Halloween festival right in, I mean, costumes and everything right there in the middle of the church sanctuary. And, and then they brought the devil in the pastor. Anyway, I'm being a little silly now. Well, the pastor's wife and, and a man in the church got that running around together. It finally got found out. The man that was running around left with his wife and came over to the first church. Now, he had just got, quote, back with the Lord. And they nominated him and voted him in as a deacon. And I'm sitting there going, 
I ain't been saved all that long. But that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. How do you nominate and set in as a deacon someone that, has been, that just got out of an affair less than six months ago? And they're going to go in there and help run, because that's how congregation rules. They're going to go in there and help run the church. And he got to running the church all right. He got to running around like he did at the other church. Now, not with the pastor's wife, but with somebody else in the congregation. Hello? I'm going to sit back down now. Yeah. Not a novice. He must be proved. Well, he's been saved. He might have been saved 20 years, but he ain't lived right but two. Hello? Well, I don't think that means that they're proven to be in ministry or to be in, in, in a leadership position. You've been saved 20, you live right too, and now you're going to be a deacon. You know, you, may be, you need to be proved. Okay? It really means to, um, to test in the hope of being successful. Okay? The word to give them careful scrutiny. And then they're being found blameless. So then they need to be found blameless. You need to scrutinize them. A man who just got through having an adulterous relationship does not need to be thrown into the church in a leadership position. As a matter of fact, if he comes into the church, they need to watch him like a hawk. Hello? And you need to be set aside. Now, here's the deal. You just came out of adultery. I'm going to tell you, I better not catch you alone with a woman anywhere in this building. That's not love. No, yes, it is. Why? If their flesh had been in adultery and they just simply repented, they need corrective discipline or watching over or accountability, let's put it that way, for a good season until they have proven themselves to be blameless again. Don't let me catch you in the back room with the door shut. We won't do nothing. I don't care. You might have been thinking about it. Hello? And if you're thinking about it, you're probably going to be looking for the opportunity to do what you're thinking about. Amen. Oh, you don't have any mercy. I got plenty of mercy. The fact that you're in the building is merciful. <laughs> Hello? But to put you in a position of authority and leadership, churches wake up and stop being stupid. You're setting them up for failure. You're just putting them in a position to fail. I mean, it's like taking a bank robber and making him the head usher. Well, he got saved. He got saved, but his flesh needs some help. Hello? Going to turn him loose with the key and the cash? I heard Philip Godot tell a story one time. They had a, they had a, a, a secretary or a, a, a board member. Now, I can't say the things Philip Godot said because he could get away with saying what he said, but I can't say it. That man stole $50,000 from the church, and he was running for city council. That's what he was. A, he was a, a city politician. And Philip Godot is going to go down there, in the same, and I think he's in San Francisco or Sacramento, maybe Sacramento. And he's going to confront this guy. This guy's going to give a speech on his, on his politics, and they're trying to pull him outside. Pastor Godot, you can't do it. We got, we got to stand with our people. And he said, that stole my money. <laughs> I'm at Creflo's Ministers Conference so that you can imagine what I stood out like. But I'm in the floor. They said, no, 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 you don't, don't, don't stir up any trouble. We, no, we, we're a community. Hey, I don't care. He, that, stole my money. Now, you know how black folks are when they start talking like that. They all think it's hilarious. This white person did too. <laughs> I am laughing so hard. And they all looking at me like, yeah. <laughs> I'm down on the floor. I'm just about to turn around beating my chair. Because he kept saying it. You're 
just don't, you, you got to watch which, who, who's in place of where. Hello? Because what had happened, they needed to go pay a payment on the bill and went down there to find, get the money to pay it, and it won't in the bank. And that's how they found out the guy had been stealing the money. The money wasn't in the account, and they needed to pay, pay they were getting ready to pay off the, something on the, on the loan or something, and the money won't in the bank. Because he stole his money. <laughs> Hallelujah. Y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? All right. Yeah. Now, he, I'll go out and listen to that tape sometime, and it just, I mean, my sides hurt, like a Medea movie. Your daddy was a pimp. All right. My daddy won't know Rolling Stone. Your daddy was a pimp. All right. So it must be found. Now, even so, must their wives be great. Now, here the Greek word guni is used for woman and wife, and it's really not really clear if Paul's saying deaconesses or wives here. Okay? But he's saying, in, in either case, he's saying that, they, that the, 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 if they're deaconesses or if they're wives, I, I got to kind of think he's talking about deaconesses because he's, he's, in, a, he's in a section talking about uh, positions of authority in the church. They may, can't be slanderers. That means uh, malicious talkers. They, can't, they need to be sober, just like the other one. They need to be faithful in all things. It means uh, absolutely trustworthy. Amen? And then he goes on and says this, and let the deacons be the husband of one wife. They spoke the same thing. And then he finishes this. Up. Well, let me see here. No, 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 no. Didn't finish this up. So as he returns to the deacons, he repeats the qualifications he set forth for the bishops. Marital fidelity, that means you're the husband of one wife. Parental control, ruling their children in their own houses as well. Um, it's important for our deacons to do this, as is the pastor. In verse 13, he, he ends his instructions concerning the deacons. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness of the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, verse 14, these things write I unto you, hoping to come unto thee shortly. Um, but if I tarry long, thou mayest know. So he's left Paul, Timothy at Ephesus, wanting to go see him, but it sounds like he kind of thinks he may not be able to. But if I tarry, you know, uh, you may know. In other words, I've given you instructions. So if I'm not there, here's, what I've, here's, where, here's, my, here's where I stand on these things. Okay? Verse uh, 15 says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. Now let's stop here. Paul says we ought to, he wants Timothy to know how he ought to behave himself in the house of God. If it was all about grace and you didn't have anything, to, he would just said, uh, hey, I'm not writing you anything, just you're in grace, hallelujah, see you later. But Paul wrote things concerning conduct. How we get the idea that grace absolves us from proper conduct, I don't know. Well, I do, I do know. It's called seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and people who don't study their Bible right. Now, Guy Dunnick, my friend Guy Dunnick, put something out there um, yesterday, and I don't remember what it was, but I, I, I comment. I said, it's amazing what you find in the Bible when you read all of it instead of just the scriptures that address your preferred narrative. His response back was, ain't that the truth? We and Shannon were discussing this. She said, listen, just on a scholarly level, for you to do research to prove your point is bad scholarship. You are to let the research take you to the end instead of you having the end and trying to get the research to support it. It's bad scholarship. Well, it's also bad Bible study. When you create a, when you create a narrative... And then you only go for things that support that narrative and discount things that don't. And that's why, that's why it's troublesome because you will then begin to discount scriptures that co go contrary to your narrative because it messes up your narrative. Now, the narrative. We're under grace. It doesn't matter what we do. Now, that's what's being preached. Now, they may not say it exactly in those terms, but you listen to the people who talk about it. You listen to some of the stuff that's said. And I am telling you, it is what's being taught. Well, I didn't teach, yeah, but you left enough out to make it sound that way. We don't ever repent. Oh, that's what it was. Paul was addressing the elders at Ephesus, and he said, one of the things he said, that I've taught both, uh, that here's the things I've taught to both the Jews and the Gentiles. Repentance towards God and faith in Lord Jesus Christ. 
He got people running around saying no repentance. And Paul said, what I have taught to both Jews and Gentiles, repentance toward God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's when I said, it's amazing what you find when you read the whole thing. And why? Because people who don't believe in repentance, which is a lot of people now, would leave that scripture out and call people, Paul the preacher of grace, except Paul, was also said, Paul said he, he was also the preacher of repentance. Out of his own, out of his own uh, statements. Hallelujah. Okay. Um, house of, you know, in the house of God, the oikos of God means in the, God's household or in God's family. The next clause contains an expanding meaning in the word, the church, ecclesia, of the living God. Ecclesia means a company of people who have been called out and refers to the local congregation as a part of the church. Okay? So we are the local congregation. The ecclesia is the pillar and the ground of truth. The word pillar was sometimes used for decorative column that often supported statu statues of famous citizens. Ground is the support, the bulwark, the buttress that supports the building. And truth refers to the gospel. Okay? And then the word truth carries over from the previous verse. And without controversy, as great is the mystery of godliness. Great is the mystery of godliness. <laughs> God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in the glory. Okay? So, um, the first, this, is, this is actually him. And the first statements are understood only in divine revelation. The last three are attested by historical records. What, what are the first three? He's manifest in, God was manifest in the flesh. Justified in the spirit, or actually um, justified in spirit. Uh, many people say the Greek actually says, um, scene of angels. That has to be by revelation. We wouldn't know any of that. And then the third are historical records. He was preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in the glory. Hallelujah. Amen? We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address P.O. Box 7752 Greensboro, North Carolina 27417 If you would like to contribute to our ministry please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button Thank you and may God richly bless you for your giving